beer is possibly the oldest alcoholic beverage known to humans. Over the course of several thousand years, it evolved to the point of making it possible to brew it at home using very simple methods. I'm brewing such a beer today. I will be using a brew kit or a hopped malt extract. The full recipe along with some additional information can be found on the blog. The brew kit takes the form of a can containing approximately one and a half kilos or three pounds of liquid malt extract. Under the cap, there's a sachet of brewer's yeast. I start by opening the can. I dip the can opener in a no-rinse liquid sanitizer. I need to work with sanitized equipment since the wort isn't going to be boiled and I run an increased risk of infection. The extract is a dark and thick liquid with the consistency of honey. I disregard its dark colour. It's very concentrated, but in reality it's possible to make pale beer out of it. The final product's colour depends on the malts used to make the extract and additional sugars that I add to the wort. Speaking of additional sugars, I will be using a can of unhopped malt extract. The brew kit's producer suggests using a kilo of table sugar, so I know my beer will become darker. It'll also have a fuller body than intended, but I don't really like beers made with a large addition of sugar. In order to dilute the extract, I need a fermenter or a 30 litre bucket made of food safe plastic. It's also been sanitised. I have a bit of freshly boiled water in the kettle. I'll need it in a second. I start by pouring the extract into the fermenter. scrape the can's sides with a sanitized paddle. Then I use hot water to wash the remaining extract from the can. I repeat the same process with the second can. The fermenter now holds all of the extract and a bit of hot water. I mix everything with a paddle to dissolve and distribute the thick extract. The next step is filling the fermenter with additional water. I already have a bucket of boiled and therefore sterile water. It's been cooled down to ambient temperature. I place my fermenter underneath the water bucket and open the tap. I fill the fermenter to the level indicated on the brew kit's instructions. At the same time, I stir the wort with a sanitized paddle. I want to evenly distribute the extract while aerating the wort at the same time. The yeast will need the oxygen to multiply in the initial phase of the fermentation. This is why I stir so vigorously, creating a lot of foam. Midway through adding water, I cut open the yeast sachet and sprinkle the yeast into the wort. Further stirring will disperse it evenly. Wort made this way is ready to be fermented. I put the fermenter's lid on and press it down. Inside the jug filled with sanitizer, I have a grommet. I fit it in the hole drilled through the lid. Next I fish out a sanitised airlock and mount it in the grommet. I happen to use three part airlocks since they're quieter than one part ones, but that's just a personal preference. 
the type of airlock has no influence over the fermentation. I fill the airlock with a bit of sanitizer. Theoretically, I could use water, but in case of airlock contents making their way inside the fermenter, which can happen while carrying it around, I prefer the liquid to be sterile. It reduces the likelihood of infection. I place the fermenter somewhere dark and not too warm, and let the beer ferment. I'm making an ale, or a top fermented beer, so I don't need a fridge. Room temperature will suffice. The word has been inoculated with the brewer's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's the same species as regular baker's yeast, but strains made for brewing have been carefully selected with the beer quality in mind. In the first phase of fermentation, the yeast cells use up oxygen dissolved in the wort. At this stage, they multiply. This is why aerating the wort is important. When the oxygen runs out, an anaerobic fermentation begins. The yeast cells don't multiply anymore and actively focus on the consumption of a disaccharide, maltose, that's present in the wort. They excrete a range of chemical compounds, the most important of which are ethanol and carbon dioxide. The fermentation will take a few weeks. Some sources say one or two weeks are enough, but I never go below four weeks. A hasty termination of the fermentation can lead to the presence of compounds that cause unwanted aromas, such as acetaldehyde, diacetyl, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur dioxide. It's also not uncommon to have some unfermented maltose left in quantities sufficient to overcarbonate the beer. Four weeks have passed and my beer is ready for bottling. Before I put it in bottles though, I need to separate the beer from the yeast cake on the bottom of the fermenter and also mix a bit of sugar in for bottle conditioning. I pour the sugar into a mug and add a bit of boiling water. I stir until all of the sugar is dissolved. I end up with a sugar syrup, which I pour into an empty, sanitized fermenter. Bottle conditioning requires adding a fermentable sugar to a flat but otherwise ready beer. Glucose and sucrose are the most commonly used. The yeast cells left in the beer will consume the sugar and produce a small amount of additional ethanol. The ABV will go up by 0.2 to 0.5%. But the most important compound is carbon dioxide, which will carbonate the beer. However, it's necessary to remember to carefully calculate the required amount of sugar. If too much is added, the best that can happen is overcarbonation. In the worst case, the bottles may burst. I sanitize a racking tube. I spray some sanitizer over the fermenter's tap. Next, I attach the sanitized tube. I wrap the other end of the tube in a filtering cloth, a sanitized flat cotton nappy. The filter should stop any compressed chunks of trub from the fermenter's bottom. In case of dry hopped beers, it also traps the hop debris. I put the tube inside the fermenter with sugar syrup. I open the tap and carefully rack the beer, trying not to aerate it. Adding oxygen at this stage would likely result in oxidation, which creates off flavours and aromas. The racked beer swirls and moves around, so I expect the sugar to be evenly distributed without stirring. I put the filled fermenter on the table and sanitise its tap. I have a few types of bottles. A flip-top bottle has an integrated porcelain stopper with a gasket. It's the easiest to use since it doesn't require a bottle capper. Other bottle types have wide or narrow collars. Not every bottle can be used with a given capper type. All of my bottles have been washed and sterilised before use. In the case of a flip-top, 
bottling is trivial. I open the tap and fill the bottle, leaving a bit of headspace. Then I just close the stopper and I can grab the next bottle. Wide collar bottles can be capped with a cheap manual capper. It's got two arms that grab the bottle's neck and close the cap. I fill the bottle with beer. Again, I leave a bit of headspace. I place the bottle on a folded towel so it doesn't move during capping. Next, I place an open cap on the neck and use the capper to close it. I'm not used to this capper type, so I need a few attempts to cap the bottle correctly. Regardless of the collar size, a table capper will work without issues. It's bulky and somewhat expensive, but it's my favourite. I place an open cap on the bottle's neck, then place the bottle on the capper's base and press the lever. It requires some strength, but with a bit of practice, capping is very efficient this way. The beer needs to wait for a week or two before carbonation reaches its optimal level. Afterwards, the only thing left to do is to crack a bottle open and finally try the homemade beer. Mine turned out darker than the brew kit's producer had intended, but that's not an issue. The taste is pleasant. Refreshing with a marked hoppy bitterness, nicely balanced by the malty background. I realise this beer isn't going to win any contests, but I will definitely enjoy drinking it.